So yeah, it takes work out of <laughs> So I'll be talking to you about tracer construction problems and applications to DNA data data storage. And this is based on joint work with Sammy Davis, Cyrus Fraction, and the DNA data storage team at uh, Microsoft Research and the University of Washington. So first of all, what is a uh, tracer construction problem? So the tracer re reconstruction problem is a, is a fundamental problem where you want to recover a sequence from noisy copies. Okay, so more precisely, here's the setting. So you have some original sequence X that you care about. So it's some um, sequence from a finite alphabet of like N. So you can have a, you know, it could be a binary sequence, or if you're like, talking about DNA, it's a binary sequence with the alphabet being A, C, G, C. Um, and then you, have, you get um, noisy copies. These are Y1 through YM. And these are IID across copies. Uh, and they're noisy copies. And the noise consists of various things. So you can um, substitute symbols, or you can insert uh, symbols somewhere. And you can also delete symbols. Okay? And so that's the, the basic, um, these are the three different types of errors that you might see. And so the, the then, so you have these with different probabilities, and they're IID across them, along the sequence. So in every, every position, you either have an insertion, or a substitution, or a deletion, or no error with various properties. Okay. And then the goal is to reconstruct from these traces the original sequence x exactly. And so you want to minimize the pro probability of errors. So you, want to you want your, so given the, the number of traces, you want to minimize probability error, or alternatively, you can think of this as what is the number of uh, traces you need, or noisy copies you need, in order to reconstruct the probability close to one. Okay. Any questions about the problem itself? Right, so that, that's not known, and that's something I'll uh, bring up later. So here in this problem, there's two uh, different versions that are both uh, important and interesting. So one is when this x may be arbitrary. So the worst case, so it's any, so your algorithm should be correct no matter what the input strength is. Or this initial sequence, this initial sequence could be uh, random. So that's the average case problem. So then the probability of error is both over the probability over the randomness in the initial sequence and in the, in the randomness in the noise. And so here in this problem, the main difficulty comes from the, the, the deletions and the insertions, which sort of misalign all the sequences. And so the substitutions aren't the, aren't the big issue. So often, this problem is considered simply with just deletions to simplify things. So no insertions, no substitutions. So just you pass the sequence through the deletion channel, where each a bit or each base gets deleted in some property, and then uh, you get the, the copies, the traces in this way. Okay. Any questions? Okay, so let me tell you a bit of, about the, the history of the problem and the current state of the art. So in the, this, the problem was in this form initially um, was introduced in this paper by Batu, Kana, Kana, and McGregor in 2004. And so they came up with a, an algorithm called the bitwise majority algorithm. I'll present a similar kind of algorithm in a, in a bit. Uh, and so this was successful if the deletion, this was focusing on just deletions, and if the deletion probability is something that is little of one, so if it goes to zero with, at an appropriate rate with the length of the sequence, and then it was successful. And they also showed a lower bound saying that um, you have to have, you need, definitely need um, order and traces in the worst case to recover. Um, so then in 2008, Wollenstein, Mr. Macher, Pranit, and Weider, they gave an algorithm that succeeded in with essentially exponential and square root of n traces. Then for 10 years, there was nothing. And then in 2006, 2007, uh, there were two papers which came up with the exact same algorithm and analysis, uh, and show, which showed uh, that 
if you have exponential and cube root of n traces, then you can reconstruct. Okay. And so this was uh, so called, these were, were both mean, so called mean based algorithms that use generating functions and complex analysis in, in their techniques. Let me just give you the, the high level idea of what's going on here. So suppose you're, you're so you, you have, suppose we're talking about um, binary sequences. And these A tilde J's, those are your bits in your given trace. Okay, so your trace is random. So if you, you can form this generating function, and you can look at its expected value. So these, tra these bits of your trace are random. And it turns out that this expected value of this generating function can be written in this following form. Here, Q is the deletion probability. So I'm now talking about only the deletion channel. Q is the deletion probability. P is 1 minus Q. W is just the argument of the generating function. And these AKs are the bits of the initial sequence that you care about. So the point is that this you can approximate from your samples by averaging the generating function over the different traces. And these AKs are what you really want to get after. So you can approximate the left hand side, and so that you'll get approximately the right hand side, and from that you can read off your sequence. Okay, so that's the basic idea for these uh, algorithms and approaches. And so lately there were a couple of papers that improved the lower bound from n to essentially n to the three halves. And this is where the state of the art is. So there's n to the three halves is the lower bound, and exponential to n cube root of n is uh, the upper bound. So there's an exponential gap between these. Okay. So there's also the average case problem, where the input string is a random. And here, essentially, this same kind of exponential gap remains, but on a logarithmic scale. So the best um, you know, an upper bound is by Holden, G. Mantle, and Perez, and it uses exponentials in the cube root of log n traces. And the lower bounds are uh, poly, poly logarithms. Any questions about all this? OK, so this is a wide open problem. Um, and what I want to tell you about uh, in this talk is this question. So yeah, that, I do have a question. And so when you say that when you fix the immediate, then it's um, to go below a certain error margin in the construction? Yeah, yeah. So, so suppose you want a uh, uh, probability of correctly constructing being 1 minus delta, or like 99%. Any other questions? Okay, uh, so where was it? Yeah, so in the socket. Okay, so this problem is still completely wide open, but what I want to tell you about is an application, so where uh, this problem actually arises directly. Uh, so I want to tell you about that a little bit and how various approaches to this problem in practice. And then I also want to tell you about various variants of this problem that naturally arise from, from practice as motivated by practice. And then I want to tell you about um, and generalization of this problem where we have some results. OK, so the application I want to tell you about is DNA data storage. And the motivation for this is that the amount of data we're generating is growing exponentially at a much faster rate than the amount of storage capacity we have. So we have to, that's, this is a problem that we have somehow have to solve. And uh, DNA has the potential to be a solution here because primarily because of its high density. So uh, potentially you could store 10 terabytes at the bottom of that test tube. Um, and potentially if, if this uh, if DNA data storage does uh, become uh, practical and, and it scales up to the, the limit that it can, then it can be six, seven orders of magnitude uh, denser than the current uh, storage current forms of storage. So you know, potentially you could store all the publicly available data on the internet in the shoebox, which is immense compared to you know, the massive data centers that are all over the world with all the big, big tech. Um, and of course, there are various other desiderata that you would like. You would like um, this to be durable and uh, also easy to manipulate. Um, so 
let me not get in, I don't want to talk too much about this right now. Uh, but the point is that this is, DNA data storage is something that um, could solve some big problem. And so currently, there are many groups around the world that are working on this. And in particular, one is at a Microsoft Research in the University of Washington. I, I'm also uh, part of this group working with them. And so here, and this is a, a group of like 25, 30 people, and it's a wide variety of people from like um, computer scientists, cooking theorists, all the way to um, chemists, organic chemists who are in the wet lab. Uh, so here, this is like half of the group today. And so, so the group, the group, we successfully stored 200 me megabytes of data in synthetic DNA, and then successfully retrieved it without error. Okay, so 200 megabytes, of course, with current standards is not a lot of data, but say 20 years ago, that was a lot of data, right? So this is certainly a proof of concept, and the key difficulty now is to scale this up. Question. How does this compare to like the George Church type of like encoding of videos? Is that a similar amount of data, or, or is that? Yeah, that, so they, that, uh, I'm not sure exactly, that was like maybe on the order of a megabyte. Okay, okay. Yeah, this is yeah, yeah. so the, so George Church here has group that is working on the end of this group. Yeah. Now is your readout better than theirs, or do you, do you have an estimate of that? Uh, so you, you've encoded more data, but you have better readout as well? In terms of like, the speed In terms of uh, like, error, yeah. Oh, so this, I mean, without error, so there's okay. so I guess. And, well, I guess you can make it like <laughs> redundancy, but so here, for instance, here, like the added redundancy was something like 15%. Okay. I'm not sure how it is for so yeah. yeah, and actually, so there's, uh, so George Church has a group that's working on this. There's this group. There's there's several groups around the world who are, that are working on the DNA data storage, and there's various aspects that you might care about. Um, so yeah, so, sorry. Um, for instance, uh, like an OK Go video. <laughs> that was, uh, you know, the one which is like. Um, <laughs> uh, but the root world Wilbur. Yeah. yeah, and things like the declaration of independence. <laughs> okay, uh, anyway, so there's a whole lot that can be said about the DNA story, and there's a whole pipeline. You know, you have your data, you add some redundancy to it, and there's uh, various particular ways you, you encode it, and then you write the data to DNA via DNA synthesis. Um, and I should say that, so the idea of data, DNA data storage goes back to like 50 years ago or 60 years ago, but it's right now that the technology, the biotechnologies have come to the point, in particular DNA synthesis, that is the point where this can become a reality. So if you're, you know, one question that's often asked is well, like, what's the bottleneck of, of you know, scaling this up? And DNA synthesis is the newest technology, and that's where, you know, that's where what is least um, evolved. No, so that's where. Okay, thank you. So once you've stored your data in uh, DNA, uh, you can read it, first do some PCR, and then sequence the data via various technologies, and then you want to decode it. And this is where the trace reconstruction problem appears. So essentially, in the decoding process, you have a big pool of DNA sequences that are just unordered floating in your test tube, and you have, because of PCR, which amplifies um, the, the DNA sequences, so you have, for the DNA sequences you initially have, you have several copies of each, and so floating around in your pool, and then the first step is to cluster similar reads, and so then you have a bunch of clusters of a few sequences, and then in each sequence, the problem is this trace reconstruction problem. Okay. Okay. And then there's, you would undo the inner and outer codes and to recover your sequence. Any questions about this? Does this get read over time? Like if you keep on reading it? Uh, um, on doing the PCR? Yeah, yeah. Um, but so the PCR amplifies the, so essentially you're, you're creating copies of PCR, so that is fine. 
but so one question is um, degradation over time. Uh, so if you just leave the, you know, your data in DNA for like a bunch of time, you know, what will happen if you come back three years from now or ten years from now? Um, that actually, how the, how uh, this is simulated is you heat it, heat it up to so some high temperature, and that kind of simulates aging. Apparently, I mean, I, I'm not, I don't know that much about the, the chemistry behind this, uh, but yeah, that's how you can simulate aging. And apparently, this is very uh, durable, so it can potentially be stored for much, much longer than you know, like floppy disks. I'm sure half the room will know what a is. <laughs> okay. So, uh, sorry. Uh, so the um, after sequencing, the traces are really like um, how how uh, how faithful is the theoretical model to what chunks of DNA you see after sequencing? Like, do you really see like when you see like contiguous chunks? Do you see like you know you know like pieces of DNA like? How are the traces, like, what is a realistic model of how the whole traces you get up the sequencing? Uh, so, it depends on the sequencing method, I would say. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I'll come back to this in a few slides. Uh, but for instance, Illumina sequencing, the errors are, you know, they're not IID across the sequence, but they're reasonably well approximated by IID. Uh, but then there's other, other sequencing methods, like that, for which that's fun, and there it's, it's not, you know, then there's a different kind of error distribution. So this is going like the previous one was just asked. Um, so usually when you, like, even when you PCR things, these are relatively short. Yeah. Yes. Um, and so you have, you, so you have, so I think of this as you have an enormous single long span, and now you're chopping it up, and, and but you did like the clustering, like what did that correspond to? Yeah, yeah, so maybe, okay, I, I didn't want to get involved in this, but so first you have, um, one big, long. one big long sequence, that's your data. Yeah. And then chop it up into short sequences. And then one thing that we do at basically any of these methods, uh, any of these groups do, is you add a little address portion uh, to each little sequence. So then once, you, if you've recovered all the little sequences, then you don't have to do assembly to put, put everything together. You just, uh, you know, you can just order them in a while. Uh, yeah. And, and the short, like, you sort of, you might as well assume that these short little um, bar codes are not that Yeah, so there's like added, there's like extra features on, on those to, to extra protection. And, and so, I mean, is that the problem? So I understand, I guess, do you have described the exact same problem and it only has blue arrows? Like, I mean, is that like accurately decoding DNA? Is that not the problem that people are interested in? Whether they have actual data that they put in there or not? Uh, yeah, but I would say that you know, like when you, for instance, when you when you sequence, you know, some organism, then then the assembly problem is like a big uh, problem. And so here, this is because you can't, you you have you know, freedom. you reach and you yeah. the lineup. And so so you have you in, in, in other words, you have some freedom in how to design your, your data, if you wish, and, and that's advisable. And where does the deletion come from? Well, the, the, I guess the, the sequencing technologists have some deletion. Also, they could come from just uh, the synthesis as well. You know, there might be some some data that you don't even write. There, there could be errors in the synthesis process. So, yeah. Any other questions? Okay, um, so here's just a simple algorithm that, that, that uh, we use in, in practice, and this is um, it's a modification of this DME al algorithm that I mentioned previously, where essentially you you go along, so here are your 10 traces, and you want to reconstruct the sequence, and you go from left to right, uh, and you have some pointers of where you are at the moment, and then you want to compute an estimate of the next base. And so a natural thing to do is to do a plurality vote. But then what you have to figure out is what, you know, if you look at the pointers are in the colored positions and the plurality among the colored uh, squares is an A. So, okay, A is my estimate. 
And then the natural thing to do with the pointers is to move them by one for the correct ones, but what do you do with the incorrect ones? So how, how do you move them? And so what we do is, so for instance, you have the uh, a red, you know, let's look at the blue C here at the top, at the, at the bottom. Um, so you want to classify the, this, the error there as either a substitution or an insertion or a deletion. And how we do that is we look at a local neighborhood. Okay. We look at a no local, local neighborhood, and we look at also a local neighborhood of the correct traces, and try to, from this, infer whether the error there was an insertion, deletion, or substitution. And, and once you, we've classified the error in a particular way, then we move the pointer accordingly. So you can figure out the, if the error was substitution, or insertion, or deletion, how much you move the pointer by, either 0, 1, or 2. Any questions about this? So this turns out to work well in practice, especially when, for, uh, when the error rate is relatively low. So here are some uh, simulations, but also in, 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 in practice, for the linear sequencing where the error rate is relatively low, um, about 1 to 2%. Oh, W is this, uh, the width of this window of the local neighborhood. And um, so in practice, you know, this works very well and we can recover um, from median coverage of five uh, traces. And it depends on, you know, this has some variance. But from a very low number of uh, traces, we can recover. But uh, what I'd like to tell you about now is, you know, there are still various challenges that come from the practice. practice and in particular in this problem of trace of So I want to tell you a few variants of the trace of reconstruction problem that I think are interesting that are motivated by viewing the problem through the lens of uh, DNA data okay. So one is that, so the sequencing method matters in terms of the error distribution. Uh, so Illumina sequencing works well and it has like an error rate of one to 2%. So that's if the, only if the sequences are short. And so ideally you would have to, like, you would like longer sequences, <coughs> density would be higher than in terms of uh, the amount of data that goes to the redundancy. Um, and so there are other methods. So in, in particular, nanopore sequencing is a method that has become uh, more and more popular. And it can, so with nanopore sequencing, one can sequence um, very much longer reads, so reads on the order of tens of thousands thousands or 10,000 uh, base pairs. However, it, it suffers from a high error rate, so on the order of 10 to 12 uh, percent. And moreover, the errors are far from ID. The errors are actually uh, in burst. So if you have an error, you're much more likely to have subsequent errors. And this is somehow, it, it, it comes from the, the physical mechanism of how, how the sequencing is, 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 uh, is happening. So you have this so it's called nanopore sequencing because you have a little nanopore and you're pulling the, your sequence through this nanopore and depending on how, uh, what uh, base you have in the middle of this nanopore, it changes the surrounding uh, field in a particular way and it allows you to read off uh, what base you have there. But in order for this to be successful, you need to pull at a constant speed. And if you pull too fast, you're going to have a bunch of conditions. If you pull too slow, you're going to have insertions. And, and, and so that's why they have to be um, So in practice, we developed a new algorithm that's kind of a variant of the previous one to, to deal with um, this issue. And so this was critically necessary in the successful decoding of a recent file. And so now we have pretty good algorithms that work also for uh, nanopore sequencing. The coverage is Greater. So it's more like on the order of maybe 20, 30 um, traces that, that are needed to recover, but it still pretty, works pretty well. So another question is approximate trace reconstruction, which, which Greg brought up. So you might want to not to, to reconstruct the sequence not precisely, but approximately. So one natural way to frame, uh, frame this question is to reconstruct up to edit distance, the edit distance epsilon times depth. And 
question is, okay, this is definitely you know, not harder, but is this much easier? Could it be that it's much easier to do this than uh, reconstruction of the map? And the answer is, I don't know. As far as I know, there haven't been, there haven't been, any, uh, there haven't been any results about this. And so another question is, what about uh, generalizations to other data structures? And in particular, this is motivated by the fact that if you have some additional structure, then that can make trace reconstruction sort of easier. So, so, so per, 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 perhaps you could solve this problem with fewer samples due to the additional structure that you have. And so in particular, so I want to tell you about some recent work that is joined with joint work with Simon Davis and Cyrus Sebastian about uh, essentially generalizing the trace secret trace reconstruction problem to trees. And um, so uh, various results here. And so we had a couple of motivations. One was to better understand. So for the trace reconstruction problem, the kind of techniques that we have are, there are two types of techniques. One are these more combinatorial techniques. So for instance, the algorithm that I, I told you about, and there are similar kinds of algorithms that are that are kind of more combinatorial in nature, or there are these complex analytic generating function type of techniques. We want to understand um, you know, the interplay between these techniques, what techniques could work well in what kind of situations, and um, so we, we look at uh, the problem on trees, hoping that there, the additional structure could help understanding this, understanding this interplay. And the other kind of motivation is maybe a bit far-fetched, but actually, it might not be that our question is that um, so actually, so it turns out that um, research on DNA nanotechnology has been able to create structures of DNA molecules that are more complex than the line, but say uh, lattices or trees. I've been told that in, in various forms of DNA synthesis, they actually have to cleave some of the DNA sequences in order for them not to branch out into trees. Uh, so there could be potential applications for the data. Is it, is it accurate or not to uh, say that the internal methods are trying to impact on my and things like that other things are trying to do the same Um I would no, I don't I don't think they're trying to do impact on my They're more like some kind of uh, you know, going along the the sequence most of life which is trying to do some kind of Plurality, majority type of things. Yeah, but maximum likelihood, yeah, I don't think anyone has really any results. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay, any other questions? Okay, so let me tell you about this generalization to trees. Um, so here's just a sequence, and you can think of a sequence as well, there's a root node on top, and it has these um, n children. And when I delete, so I'm, I'm only going to focus on deletions, uh, and I'm going to formulate a particular deletion channel for trees. So if I delete these uh, bits in gray, then I get the sequence on the right. So here's a deletion model for trees, which we call the tree at a distance model, because that's it's related in some way to tree at what's called tree at distance. So here, here's a binary tree. And you can delete these bits in gray. And then what, what happens then is that when you delete this bit, say this one, then its children move up to the parent of this uh, vertex. So essentially, you can also think of just deleting the vertex and also the edge above. So that'll be the deletion model. So you have some kind of underlying tree, and it has some, we, we assume always that there's a fixed root and the root is uh, never deleted. And you have some bits in, in the vertices, and then you apply this deletion model. So you delete each vertex with probability Q, and then vertices move up, we have some other tree with some other bits on it, 
And the goal is to recover from traces like this the original labeling of the tree. Okay. Any questions about the model? Okay, so this is one particular way to define the deletion channel on a tree. Um, in our paper, we also look at, we also define a different uh, model of a deletion channel on a tree, because I, I don't think there is necessarily a canonical model of the deletion channel on a tree. Um, so for instance, here, the number of children of a ver vertex can increase. And so in this other model that we defined, there that has a property that the number of children of the vertex uh, cannot increase. Uh, in any case, I won't talk about this other model, but um, you know this. Okay, so I'm going to focus on this model, and so let me tell you about our results. So again, we have some tree, and the trees we're going to focus on are complete uh, K-area trees and also something that I'll call a spider. Uh, we'll see in a second. So, so there we have, a, suppose that you have a complete KRE tree, and you have, the, the bits are labeled with our arbitrary bits, and the, the tree has n vertices in total, and so we can reconstruct with exponentially k times log, uh, k, k times log n, So the second result is that we can reconstruct k trees if k is at least like log squared n uh, with exponential in uh, k to the one third plus log n trees. But what is log so log <coughs> so uh, the, the k based log. So it's log n over log k. Yeah. It's the, it's like the depth of the and so in particular, uh, from this it follows that if k, so in the carry tree, is a constant, or if it's between like, log squared n and log cubed n, then following all the n traces suffice, which is uh, better than, this is not known and it's not clear if it's even true for the uh, problem on the line. So these are upper and lower bounds? So these are just no, these are, uh, these are upper bounds. <coughs> and so really here, this x of k to the one third, this is really um, like the number of traces required for a line times poly n. OK. Any other questions? Can you just repeat how this relates to, is there a biological example or other like regular example if this is the case where you have trees, or is it it's just a kind of a, a fun extension? Yeah, let's. That's an extra. Okay. Fun extension. <laughs> For now. Oh, okay. okay. And um, okay, so here's this other uh, type of tree. Suppose you have uh, a root vertex, and then you have uh, n over d paths of length d or depth d. Okay. So this is kind of a two-dimensional generalization, if you wish, of, of a path. Um, and so we call these, this is an ND spider. And it turns out, so here, okay, there's some exponential in n to the one third and q to the zero to three traces. Anyway, the point is that um, this is better than if you, what you would get if you would just uh, naively apply the path construction results on each map. And I'll get to this in a second. So roughly in the last few minutes about some proof ideas. So essentially at a high level for these first for the results on KRE trees, trees we use more kind of discrete combinatorial types of methods. And for this last result, we can extend this Generating function method and complex analytic uh, analysis to this spider test. So the k to the one third is from complex analytic method? No, no, this, this is, I don't you know, I just put this in the slide, and this is what is known, but here really this should be the number of traces required for the, the sequence of the path. So okay. Okay. Here, this is like, 
here we don't have to. This, this is what comes out of the point. So there, that's just the, so there's a reduction to the point. So the idea is to look at, so okay, here's a, a binary tree. And we want to reconstruct some particular subtrees at a time. And how we do this is we look at paths down to the to a leaf, and then all the leaves of, along that are at the bottom of this path. And if the trace contains not only this path and the leaves at the bottom, but also kind of these uh, neighboring vertices in yellow that certify, uh, so these are, we call this a, a caterpillar. And so if the trace contains all this, then these the yellow legs of the caterpillar kind of certify that these, the labels in the subtree are usually correct. I won't go into details about this, but that's, um, so these extra nodes are those that witness, are witnesses to the fact that the trace is in the correct position. And such a caterpillar survives with, uh, so the number of nodes in this caterpillar is roughly k times k uh, depth. Okay. And for the other, uh, for this, the spider, so we can extend this generating function technique and essentially, so this is the, so if you, we have the generating function of the trace, and we la the labeling of the, of the trace we do in a DF test order, test first order, order, then you can write down the expected value of this generating function, and well, there are essentially two uh, terms here, two uh, factors, one corresponding to uh, which path you're on, which leg of the spider you're in, and the other corresponds to where in the spider you are. And it turns out that uh, okay, it's more complicated than the previous uh, polynomial that was there, but you can still uh, analyze this. And you get uh, something that is better than if you would just apply straight to the paths. Right? Okay, so let me summarize. So I talked about the trace between structure problem, which is, I think, a very exciting and fundamental problem which is completely open. So the main problem is whether or not the polynomial and many traces suffice. I also talked about the DNA data storage, where we have a proof of concept and exciting challenges and where this trace reconstruction problem uh, is directly there and is applied. And I also told you about this problem of reconstruction trees and traces, where the, the punchline is the conditional structure Thank you very much.